All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, happy uh, Thanksgiving Eve. So uh, this is going to be sort of our, I guess, our last class that covers new material. Yep. And um, yep, happy Thanksgiving Eve as well. So basically, um, so for right now, I guess it looks like it's our last kind of class with new material. And then, um, I mean, depending on how far I get today, but anyway, next week will be just sort of a review either session, either one or two days, we'll see how it goes. If I need to you know, use up two days to cover exam review or just one day. But anyway, it's going to be uh, that. Um, I have the video um, posted for the assignment nine. It's linked in the assignment nine sort of section on uh, Canvas. If you have like the PDF, you know, content has like the link right there as well. I didn't put it onto the PDF, but I put it onto the um, Canvas um, assignment area. So you have that. So I guess I'm going to now just sort of go straight into the new topic because I guess um, just to try to get through this hopefully today is my goal. So let's go ahead and just um, move along here. Um, I didn't only I really went over Chris goals yet here on the uh, board. So let's go ahead and make a new page for this. So let's go over uh, Chris goals algorithm. Right, let me go ahead and put the lines number here as well. Awesome. So uh, this is going to be a minimum uh, spanning tree algorithm. Okay, so first we have to go over, well, what's a tree? What's a spanning tree and then what's a minimum spanning tree. Let's go ahead and cover all of those right now. So I guess we a tree is a minimally connected graph. So basically, um, the whole idea is that it's really a graph, it's just a very, um, a very sparse graph, if you will. So basically, for a tree, um, if there are V vertices, so once again, a cardinality of V, if you have V vertices, then there are V minus one edges. Now, we're gonna be discussing this really with um, undirected graphs. We're gonna be using, so we're gonna be doing undirected graphs for this example, so I guess, for undirected graphs. So you're gonna have exactly V minus one edges, no more, no less. So if you have that many, that's gonna be enough edges to connect all the nodes together in the graph. And also, I guess I'll just say there's no um, simple cycles. Now, what I mean by that is, of course, if you have an undirected graph, you inherently have a cycle, obviously, because you can take the edge two directions. But for us, we're going to consider a cycle that involves if you take more than two edges and you only go one direction. So, for example, um, in this example right here, this graph, this is going to be a tree. So we're going to say this has no cycle. So if you only can take the edge and take one direction only, then there's no way you can create a cycle because if you go ahead and take this edge. And then this edge, there's uh, no cycles in this case. So there's, we're going to go ahead and consider a simple cycle as in a case where we only take one direction on each edge. But this right here, for example, would not be an example um, of a tree. Because here, if I go ahead and I take one direction only, well, it's pretty clear I can definitely can um, have a cycle in this case. So the whole idea is if you take only one direction for every undirected edge, we can't have a cycle. That means we'll have, that's going to be a tree basically. So the idea is that, um, one of these three, one of these edges, either this, this, or this is redundant. So really we can remove one of these edges from this graph and it will be still connected. So the whole idea is you want to create a, a tree basically. 
So a spanning tree is just a tree that spans the graph, which that's a good definition. So a spanning tree is a sub graph of uh, G, where G is going to be a graph that um, connects all the nodes. So this tree spans the graph. It connects every node together. So basically, given the following graph like this, this is a very simple graph right now. This is a very overly complicated graph, but here we go. So I'm going to go ahead and use green to kind of mark the edges. So basically, um, this would be your spanning tree, essentially. Um, I'll just pick up something, not, not this one. Um, this, and then uh, this. So the edges that are marked in green is going to be your spanning tree. So um, edges marked in green are the spanning tree edges. And any other edge we have is not marked in green. Well, it's okay, but it's really a redundant edge because we don't really need that to connect these nodes together. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to take a graph and get a spanning tree. We want to get sort of only edges that will just minimally connect the graph without having any extra redundant edges. So really, uh, for Crystal's algorithm, we're trying to do is suppose you have a network and each edge would be sort of a line, your network or connection. And let's say you have to cut back on your connections because you're downsizing a company or whatnot. And you want to uh, maintain a connected network, but you want to have it minimally connected. So you want to have minimal cost and just enough um, edges to just have everything connected, but you don't want to, you want to throw out all of the redundant edges, basically. That's what we're trying to do. So given this sort of network, for example, if we only maintain those green edges, then we still have um, a connected network and we can sort of save by, we can remove the rest of these edges basically and still have um, a network. So think of it like this, if I remove these edges, everything is still connected to each other. It just, we don't, we don't need these extra edges basically just to maintain this connected network. That's the whole idea of a spanning tree and put these back in. So that's what I'm talking about. And then a, um, a minimum spanning tree of a graph G is a spanning tree um, of minimal minimum weight of edges. So for a graph, there's obviously more than one possible spanning tree. So the graph above right there, I could have chose other edges that are marked together. There's more than one possible solution. But you want to find the one spanning tree whose combined edge weight of that spanning tree is minimum. That's what we're trying to actually do. That's basically it. So uh, it's actually a very simple algorithm, actually. So this should be a very easy, light day today. And on exams, literally, I can count on one hand. I've taught this class for about, I don't know, four or five years. I can count on one hand. How many students have messed up this question on the exam? It's a very simple algorithm. So really a very nice light 
you know, pre Thanksgiving uh, class. That's kind of, you know, that's definitely good news. There's the last new material and it's also not really hard material either. So let's go over the um, pseudo code. Actually, first I have to cover one more thing. Never mind. So we need to also cover a data structure to make this work. Okay. So you have to cover this union find data structure. We have to cover this before we do anything else. Okay. Um, basically, this is also known as a disjoint set as well. But I'm going to call it union find just because. But it's also known as this joint sets is what it's also called sometimes. So you can find is going to be a way, a very quick way to determine if an edge to be added to the spanning tree is redundant or not. So it's going to be a fast way to determine if two nodes in um this in in the um in the uh spanning tree or in the uh potential and spanning tree so say in spanning tree are connected or not we're gonna start off you know this algorithm that we're gonna have a forest and I guess it makes sense because a forest is a collection of trees. So we're gonna have several trees, which will be a forest. And we're going to determine when we're adding edges into our spanning tree, we're gonna make sure that this edge is not going to be redundant edge. So it's a way to quickly determine if two nodes are already, are already connected to each other. If they already are connected to each other, then there's no need to add this edge into our spanning tree. But we'll do the example uh, and then we'll make more sense of that. So basically, uh, for this union find structure, we're going to have a leader array, a leader array is, um, is, uh, maintained to determine which set a node belongs to. This is not proper grammar because you can't end on a preposition in a sentence, but you know what? It's okay though. I think we understand what that means. So that's the important part. Maybe I think a leader array is maintained to determine in which a set belongs. I guess that's probably the more proper English. I don't know, but we'll just go with that for right now. So basically what we're going to do is the following. So if I have a leader U equals V, that means, um, V is the leader of the group that you belongs in. Another bad, an another terrible grammar sentence. You can't end on the word in, but you know what? We're going to go with that. <laughs> That's, I, I, I like that. So language is just a tool. The transmit ideas. I like that. I'm, I'm going to go with them. I'm going to, I'm actually going to stay up from now on. That's actually pretty cool. I like that. So alrighty then. So I'm going to, we can go ahead and just agree that we're just communicating ideas and that's all there is to it. Perfect. I like that. So, um, okay. So basically we're going to use, I'm going to use sort of a tree example to kind of show this because it makes it easier to sort of, um, visualize this structure, but anyway, we have to go over what does a find. So what's going to be you need to find uh, functions. So a find function. So find you is going to return the leader of you. So it's going to do the following. It's going to say, well, if, um, if I was, I was put in pseudo code version, if leader you is itself, then just return you else we're going to go ahead and just say well we'll just say leader um you equals find leader you and then return 
leader you now i guess i'll i'll illustrate this this is actually known as a path compression this portion right here and hopefully get an example where we see this actually happen but if not i'll just sort of explain this right now so this is sort of a method okay so path compression is really kind of once again a lazy approach and by being lazy we learned this already from earlier examples being lazy actually gives you better run times you know sometimes at least so being lazy can improve run times so path compression is not a lazy technique that actually does sort of save um, in the long run so anyway the whole point of path compression is really this so suppose you have the following uh, you know fine structure like this we have um and let's put these over here we have a b c and d and we had the following setup so obviously um you wouldn't you would store it like in this kind of fashion so what happened is you would have a uh, leader a equals a leader b equals a leader c equals b and leader d equals c so you have it stored like this actually in your array but i'll use this um um pictorial representation on the left side to kind of help us sort of you know visualize this but you would have it stored like this actually if you were to code this algorithm so if i do a find on a well it would return a a is a leader of its of this uh, group and of course if you do a find function on b it will return a as well now if i do a find on d we can see here at d points to c c points to b and b points to a so right now this is going to be path compression this is going to be path compression i'm going to go ahead and ink this to shape well it came out it came out slanted but you know what good enough i don't want to have to redraw that so path compression occurs what that means is that is that this so d and c don't point directly to a but this find d is going to basically it's going to do this it's going to compress d and c to both point to a it's going to update that so this portion right here in blue this portion right there is going to do exactly this it's going to compress d and c to point directly to a like that so next time if i do a find c and find d it returns a but it's going to be faster because it's going to automatically have a will be the immediate lead you don't have to go through those levels to get to a that's kind of the idea so of course find d returns a now returns a e either way but doing this path compression is going to speed the runtime up next time around if i do a find c and find d again it will return a as well but it will be a faster operation next time around that's what this really means so in layman's terms, all find does is it returns the leader of that group. So I guess it's a pretty large group, so we can assume that A is going to be, I guess, I'm going to use uh, maybe Game of Thrones references. I'm guessing it's that show is still kind of relatively recent enough to remember that. So I guess A would be Tywin Lannister, and then B, C, and D, we'd have, I guess, Tyrion, Cersei, and Jaime, I suppose. So anyway, um, let's go ahead, and I'll go over a union operation okay so we have a game of thrones uh fan or at least somebody who knows of game of thrones so that's 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 good so this will make this class a bit more entertaining then all right so let's go ahead starts for the win okay great so we'll, this will be entertaining then it's a very simple algorithm so this will be kind of more fun to game of thrones to explain this uh the union operation is actually very simple if I want a union U and V, all we're going to have to do is just set the leader of U equals leader of V. So we're going to combine them. So basically, the idea is that uh, V um, 
B um, is in the larger group. So this being the case, if I do this assignment, that means um, U's leader is, so the leader of uh, U is not going to be leader of V. So this really means that one family will consume the other family. So we always wanna make sure that the bigger family is gonna consume the smaller one because it's going to make the runtime a little better. And um, it's kind of like combining two um, components together, just like with the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, West Germany was the more powerful Germany. So when they combined the two Germanys, West Germany consumed East Germany. East, West Germany was more powerful than East Germany. So basically union is we're gonna combine two houses together. We're gonna marry these two members together. And then the leader of the two houses, so the two houses, leader U, leader V, the bigger house, the leader of the bigger house becomes a leader of this bigger combined house. We'll do the example to make more sense, but that's all we have to do. And this is a very simple operation. This leader U equals leader V is a lazy approach. But then we're going to fix that laziness later on with this path compression, which is going to really only have a bad runtime in certain cases, but overall it's an average out to be pretty fast. Okay, so now we have these uh, structures set up and I promised a very simple algorithm. So let's go over um, the actual pseudocode of Kruskal's algorithm. And I'll go over the um, example and then really this whole unit find should be very simple to follow with this algorithm. So what we're gonna do is um, we're gonna first, we're going to um, insert um, edge weights into a min heap. So we're gonna go ahead and just, you know, we can take all the edges we have, put it into an array and do a build heap to construct a, a min heap out of the edges. That's all we're gonna do. And then we're going to do is while, while the um, min heap is not empty, we're going to just basically, I guess I should probably just use, maybe just use bullets instead. So let's do like this instead. So what will happen here is we're going to uh, pop an edge off of the heap. So we're gonna pop um, an edge. I mean, I'll move this over to the right just slightly. We're gonna pop an edge UV off of the heap. And then if um, find U does not equal find V, then we're going to basically um, then we're going to basically um, add UV to the minimum spanning trees. MST is short for minimum spanning tree, and then we're going to union UV, and that's it. Very simple. And we'll do an example that traces this out, but this should not cause any problems. A very simple algorithm to actually uh, work out. What we're doing is popping an edge and verifying those two nodes if they are not um, connected to each other. If they're not, well, then we can go ahead and add this edge. Otherwise, discard it. So if, the, if let's say if find u equals find v, then just um, throw out the edge uv. Otherwise, add uv to the spanning tree. Let's do an example of this. It's really not going to cause any problems. This should be really easy. So let's go ahead and just um, create our graph. I'll try to make a relatively large enough graph where the example will be kind of useful. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. I think, I think that's good enough. Yeah, I think that'll work. And we're going to have basically undirected graphs. So I'm going to just add in our edges. Oops, I didn't want to come out like that. 
So maybe I can try these, try this ink to shape us, see if it's actually draw straight lines. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, oh well. Not a big deal. What happened there? I created a triangle. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, I like that. So it just doesn't draw a straight line, but it makes a triangle suddenly. That's that's cool. Um Yeah, I guess um let's try a few more. Maybe I'll add in this edge as well. I think then we can go ahead and sort of stop this. Okay. Uh, well, I guess it's too late for that, I suppose, but I guess I'll keep that in mind when I use one note again. We made it this far, yes. Alrighty. So I'm going to go ahead and add the um, weights to this. So I'm going to go ahead and just maybe put in maybe... Um, one over here, maybe I'll try uh, two, and I'll try three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Oops, I, I need one more. I'm gonna make this over here. This will be nine, and this will be 10. Okay. I think that works. Okay, so we have our graph and we have our weights assigned to it. So I'm going to go ahead and put my union fine structure right over here. So I'm going to, so we have, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, um, seven um, nodes. This is a little larger. One, two, three, four, five. Six, and I guess I'll put this, I'll put seven over here. Sure. So let's go ahead and uh, label these. This is going to be, uh, this portion right here is going to be our union fine structure. It's not going to be part of the graph. This is going to be used to sort of um, maintain that, which nodes in which sort of uh, group. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and take these edge weights and throw them into a min heap. Okay. So Step one, we're going to have to pop an edge off of the heap. And obviously, it's a greedy algorithm. So we're going to pick the next best edge, which is going to be the edge with the weight of one. So uh, BD is my first um, edge that's going to get processed. So step one, we're going to pop BD. That's our, that's our first um, edge to look at. That's our smallest edge weight. Okay, fine. So... Then we're going to go ahead and we're going to do a find B and find D. We're going to make sure that these two um, nodes, B and D, are not um, already connected to each other. So we see here, find B, well, look, looking at this portion right here, so B is own leader and so is, um, so is D. So what happens here is find B, if you look at this union find structure to the right, this structure over here, I don't know if you can see the mouse cursor, but the structure over here, looking at this, right now every single element is its own leader. So find uh, B returns B, put this here, I guess, in um, red, and then find D returns D. So they are not in the same group. So we can go ahead and we can um, add uh, B, D to the MST, and we're also going to union these two nodes. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and mark this as a member of my spanning tree. I guess I'll, maybe I'll use this sort of neon pink, whatever, to mark this. This is going to be part of my spanning tree. And I'm gonna union these. 
Now, right now, B and D are both size one components. So I'm going to maybe as a tiebreaker, just pick the, um, the um, node with the, with the uh, earlier in the alphabetical order. So B comes first in the alphabet. So I'm going to have it where D is going to point to B. So now what happens is find B is gonna be B, but find D from now on returns B. So find B as in boy returns B as in boy and find D as in dog returns um, B as in boy. So we can see here that the leader is gonna be B for this group of two nodes. So we have to follow this arrow to know who is the leader of which um, group. Okay, so step uh, two, we gotta, we gotta pop something off the heap because our heap is not empty. All these um, edges are still on our heap. So if I pop the heap, obviously, DE is the next edge to be popped because that's the next smallest um, edge in our graph. It's gonna pop uh, DE off of the heap. So I'm gonna first investigate and see, well, are these two nodes already connected to each other? Let's find out using our find uh, functions. So find D returns B because B is the leader of the group that contains B and D. So this returns B. And then E, well, E is all by itself, so returns E. So we can see here that these two elements or these two nodes, D and E, are not connected because they have two different leaders that are in two different groups. So that means we can go ahead and add um, D and E to the MST. Are we going to also union um, D and E as well? Let's go ahead and do both of these. So I'm going to just mark this. This is going to be part of my spanning tree. Like that. And I'm going to um, union them. So right now, D is in a group of two nodes, E is by itself. So E is a smaller group. So the bigger group will consume the smaller group. So we're gonna set E's leader to point to D's leader. So D's leader is B, so E is gonna also point to B. So from now on, if I do a find B, find D and find E, all of them return B. B is the leader of all three of those elements. So anyway, let's continue along. Step three, we have to pop another node off of the heap. So right now, our next smallest would be, well, the node, the edge, sorry, AD has the weight of three. That's our next node to be popped off of this uh, heap. Okay, so let's go ahead and pop AD. And of course, we're gonna have to do a find on A and find D to be able to verify if these two nodes are in fact connected or not. So I'm going to do a find on A, that returns A, because A is by itself, and then find D returns B, so they are not in the same group. Let's find A returns A, find D returns D, so not the same. So we can definitely add this edge. So not cause any redundant edges because A and D are not currently um, connected to each other. So we're going to say, we're going to add AD to the spanning tree, and we're going to union AD as well. Okay, so I'm going to first um, add this. Oh, oh my, my mistake. Should, should be B. Yes, absolutely. You're right. Should be B. Thank you. So it's uh, B is the um, is the uh, leader of that group that that uh, D belongs in. So now we're going to see they're not the same. So we're going to add this edge into our spanning tree. So I'm going to mark this edge as a spanning tree edge. And right now 
um, the group that D belongs to has a weight of has three nodes in it. A is all by itself, so A is going to point. So A's leader, which was itself, is not going to point to D's leader, which is B. So that's all we do over there. So this might not create a path compression I wanted, but that's okay though. So this might not create what I wanted. Darn. Well, you know what? Not the end of the world, I guess. It still it doesn't really make the outcome any different, I guess. So, um, okay. Let's go ahead and look at our next um, element. So we're gonna have uh, C, E is gonna be next to be popped off of the heap. That's the next smallest um, edge. C, E. So once again, we have to do a find on C. And find E. So find C returns itself, C, and find E returns B. So these two are not in the same group. So we can definitely add this um, edge. So we're going to add C E to the MST, and we're going to union. C E. So what happens now is I'm going to add this edge. And since C is in a smaller group, we're going to set C's leader to be whatever E's leader is. So that's going to be the result of union. Okay. So hmm, this is actually an interesting example. So nothing really goes on here, but I kind of wanted to have it would, it would be a path compression example, but I guess it's not going to happen probably, but it's okay. That's it's doesn't really matter. So I'm going to probably do step six over here to call on this. So step six, our next um, edge should be popped off is going to be, um, did I do this correctly? Hold on. A, G, C. Oh, <laughs> It's supposed to be four, not five. That's that's why. It's been a long semester. Okay, I'm gonna put me. I'll put a step five below over there. So I'll two column this then. Okay, so let's go ahead and pop our next element off. So our next element is going to be uh, D F with a weight of five. We popped off next. And we're going to do a find D and find F. And um, I guess I'll just go ahead and do this. I'll scroll up here. So find D. Well, D's leader is going to be B. And F's leader is going to be itself. So basically, we see that they're not in the same group. So find D returns B. Find F returns F. Not the same. So we can, of course, we can add df to the MST, and we're going to union um, df as well. Let's go ahead and do those two steps right here. So df, we're going to mark this as part of my spanning tree. And since, so d is in a bigger family, so F is gonna to point to uh, D's leader, which is gonna be B. We can kind of see here, B is definitely Tywin Lannister because B is definitely becoming very powerful. It's getting more and more elements one by one. So um, now let's go ahead and do uh, then our next step. So step six is gonna come next. We gotta pop a node, an edge off of our heap. We're gonna pop A, B. That's our next smallest uh, weight next smallest weighted edge that's still remaining so find a and find b okay so find a returns b and find b returns b so right here we have a case where it's going to be actually equal so we're going to simply just discard um a b so the whole idea of doing this is that well we already know A and B are already connected. 
So having this extra edge added to our spanning tree is going to be a redundant edge. We don't need this edge because, well, we already can get from A to B by taking A to D and D to B. We don't have to add this extra edge, this is redundant. So we only want to add edges to the spanning tree between an edge that will connect these two nodes, but they already are connected, so we don't have to do this. And I guess Game of Thrones reference right here, here's a little weird example. Um, a is going to be Jamie Lannister, and B is Cersei. So they're both in the same family, and we do not want to union them together. Why? Because we don't want to have Joffrey appear and cause all kinds of issues in the in the Seven Kingdoms, or what that's what it's called Seven Kingdoms. Yeah, we don't want that because remember what Joffrey did in the first season? He took out Ned Stark, which caused a, a giant war in the in the realm. So we don't want that. So we don't want another we don't want another Joffrey. So I guess it would be a spoiler alert, but it's like at this point now, if you haven't watched Game of Thrones by now, then you probably aren't going to watch that. But I'll have to go ahead and um um oh <laughs> that's okay. I didn't spoil too much though. It's the show is still good. So that didn't spoil too much. It's uh but it's it's Joffrey. Joffrey basically um Joffrey was pretty much, you know, he was really good at being a very hateable character, which I think made him a fantastic um, actor because he was really hateable, which is why he was really good. He was definitely born to play Joffrey, the guy who played him. So anyway, we don't want Joffrey. So we don't want a union to um, nodes that are already connected because for one, it's going to add an extra redundant edge into our spinning tree and we create another Joffrey potentially, which is also a problem. So we can't have that. So we're gonna to have to discard this edge. So that the edge A, B is gonna get thrown out. We're not going to use this for our spending tree. Okay, let's go ahead and continue along over here. So now we're gonna have our next edge, B, E, the next smallest edge remaining. So step seven, we're gonna pop our next edge, which will be B, E next smallest available edge. I'm going to do a find B and find E. And they both return the same thing. Because find E is going to be B and find B is going to also be uh, B. So once again, we don't want to have Joffrey. So we're going to have to basically, since they're equal to each other, we're going to discard. So I'll keep it same case. So discard. Discard B because this edge is redundant because since we already know that B and E are already connected to each other, then this edge is going to be kind of useless. So this structure is a very nice and quick way to determine if these two edges are connected. We don't have to do DFS every single time on our spanning tree to verify they're connected. No, we just, in constant time, we quickly can determine that, well, um, B are in the same sort of group, in the same union, union find set, same disjoint set. So that means that B and E are already connected, so we don't have to add this edge. It would be redundant. We don't need this edge for our spanning tree. So. That's how I do this. So I was trying to get an example where, like I me, mean, I'll, I'll just create an example artificially afterwards that will kind of show you what I mean by path compression, how it can actually come up. So anyway, let's go ahead and just continue this example. Then I'll artificially create that example just so we can see that if that were to happen on an exam or whatnot. So step eight, we're going to pop our next edge, which is going to be uh, B, C is the next one to be popped. So we're going to go ahead and do a find on B. And find C. And in this case, you know, um, B and C are both going to be in the same group because B, find B returns B and find C returns B. They're both in the same group. So again, same issue. They're equal to each other. So we're going to discard. So not a hard algorithm to actually trace out. It's pretty, 
relatively easy, I think. So you have to do two more steps over here. So perfect, we're almost done. So definitely get this example done today. So awesome. I didn't want to have to stretch this all the way to next week. So it looks like it's not going to happen. So that's fantastic news. Step nine, our next available edge we have is going to be AC because we still have two edges left in our heap. And obviously AC would be at the root. So we're going to go ahead and pop AC off the heap next. And we're going to do a find A and find C. And I'm going to go ahead and just kind of shortcut this. It's going to be B for both of these. Look at our, look at our, you know, find structure. Uh, find A returns B and find C returns B. So A and C, they're both of them, their leader is going to be B, which means that A and C are already connected to each other. So we don't have to add this edge to our spanning tree. They are equal to each other. So we're going to go ahead and just simply discard um, AC. That. And we have one more edge left on our uh, heap, which is going to be FG, our last one. And then our heap would be empty, and then we're done with our algorithm. Gonna pop FG last. Do we find F? Find G. So find F returns B. Find G returns G. So we can see here that they are in fact in different uh, groups. So we can actually add this to our spanning tree. So I'm going to. Um, add fg to the spanning tree and we're going to union um fg as well so let's go ahead and do this last step so we're going to go ahead and add this and then since g is in a smaller group um find f returns b so B is the leader of the bigger group. So G's leader is not going to point to uh, B like this. And now we're done. So we see here we have one final component in our unit find structure. And we have all of our edges selected in our spanning tree. And this spanning tree, if you add up all the edge weights, it's going to be minimal. So this didn't really create the unit find structure or didn't create that path compression I wanted. Let's go ahead and just, I'm going to just create not an example graph, but just an example scenario that's going to just create this so we can see what, how this actually does come up. So I see a question here. So I'm going to first address this. Yes. Yeah, so we first popped B and D initially. Um, I could have chosen D instead of B as a leader. So for the exam, it's really kind of hard to determine. We're not going to, I'm not going to really verify the actual sort of, um, which element is like, you know, like I'm not going to verify if find B returns B and D and all that. But the idea is for this example, for exam is given this graph. So step one, step two, and step three, the find A and find D would be different. So find A would not equal find D. Now, depending on what node you choose for your leader, it could be a different sort of um, result returns. But the one thing we can sort of, no matter what you do though, on uh, step three, there's no way to find A can possibly equal to find D. That can't happen. No matter what you choose, that will never happen on step three. So for grading purposes, all I have to do is verify that when you say find A, you have to show that find A is not equal to find D. If you show that, then okay, then, we're both consistent then. So, of course, on step uh, six, no matter what nodes you chose as your leader, at step six for this graph, there's no way that find A is not going to be equal to find B. So find A will definitely equal find B. Now, maybe find A returns D and find B returns D. Well, the idea is that on step six, there's no way that find A is not going to equal find B, no matter what um, leader you choose. 
find A will equal find B on step six for this example uh, graph. So you don't have to actually have the exact same union find structure. You just have to show me that after every step, whether the finds are equal or not equal. So that way you know whether to, whether to add this edge into the uh, spanning tree or not. So basically, um, that's all you have to do really, just make sure you can do that. So, so for the exam, you have to just show me this really. So then the, the characters in red are just kind of, you know, for this example, but for the exam, all you have to do is, you know, lay out step one, step up until step 10, and then show which edge is popped off, whether to find um, of these two nodes are equal or not equal, and of course, add a union or discard based on whether they are uh, in the same group or not. So uh, for this example, same idea, you have to just show me steps on the exam. Very simple um, algorithm to actually trace out on paper. Really simple. Just one by one, pick the next smallest edge remaining, and then check that the node that connects that that edge, those, those two nodes that connected by this edge, and then check and see if the find of the two nodes are the same or not the same. If they're not the same, add this edge, the spinning tree, and union this um, these two nodes. Otherwise discard. So that's really about all there is to this um, problem. Let's go ahead and just show an example now where we can actually get, an, get a case where path compression would come up. So for example, if we had the following union find structure, so let's say we have, so this is going to be just a separate, I'm going to separate this. We don't get confused with this and the um, example I showed above. So, um, an example of where um, path compression um, can occur. So suppose we have the following. I'm going to have maybe following six nodes. Two, three, four, five, six. Suppose we have the following. So I'm going to put, I guess, A, B, C, D, E, and F. We have the following scenario. Like this. Yes. So let's say we have this scenario right here. We have the current stat, stat, status of our union find structure. Let's say we're going to go ahead and union. Put this maybe I'll put this in green just to kind of uh, I'll put it in red for right now. Let's say we're going to go ahead and union um, C and D. Let's say. So what happens here is that well D's leader is going to be itself, and union is going to take the leader of these two families. So we have A and D are our two leaders. And let's say I choose A as the leader of this combined group. What will happen is that D is not going to point to A. And we're not going to update E and F right now. We'll be lazy and not update this right now. So we're going to just, all we're going to do is we have our two leaders, and one of them is going to be the leader of the entire group. So one of the two leaders has to give up um, the leadership to the other leader. So A is not going to be the leader of D, which kind of inherently makes it where E and F are also going to be updated, but not right away, though. So now, if I go ahead and I do a find F, then this is going to actually cause this compression happen. So you only just when we do a union, we only just take our two leaders of our two groups and the bigger house, or if you have a tie, we'll just, you know, pick one of them. And one of them will become the leader of both. So the leader is updated to point to that new leader and its other members are not going to be updated right away until we do a find operation. The purpose is that, well, so the union, union, structure, union function will be fast and I guess 
we only have to update this only when we need to. So the whole idea is we're being kind of lazy, but being lazy though, it's going to be faster. So that's sort of the idea of, that's how we get the situation. So it didn't come up with our example, but with this example right here, if we have A or we have C and D, then what happens is A is a leader, D is a leader. If A leads, I mean a new leader, then D would point up to A and E and F are not going to automatically point to A right away. Until we do a find E or find F, then it's going to compress that path. So I couldn't get an example like that on this one right here, but I just kind of artificially create a scenario where this could happen. So this could have happened actually, but it didn't in our, in our example, but it could have. Okay, so that's basically uh, what I meant by that. Let's go ahead and now go over the runtime analysis for this algorithm. Okay, runtime analysis. Let me go ahead and just sort of uh, zoom in on this a bit. Runtime analysis. Well, Pretty simple, actually. So once again, we're going to um, sort of build a heap using edge weights. That's going to give us O of E, since there's E edges in our graph. Remember, it's a linear operation to do a build heap. And then um, basically, um, for each edge, so this is going to be a loop that runs e times. So a loop that runs e times. It's a little a little nicer. Let's try to. There we go. Better. We're going to first. Um, we're going to pop our heap. Pop the heap, which will take, in fact, O of log E time. Because remember, a delete min is a logarithmic operation. And then I'm going to just leave the find part out. I'm going to just add a union part here for now. So union operation is a constant operation. But find. This one is kind of interesting. Okay, so find, um, well, it has, you know, some cases where it could be constant, right? But also there were moments where we had the path compress. So doing a path compression took time, but it will not have to path compress for every node every single time, just sometimes. So um, statistically, what happens is if you combine all the work that find will do, it will ultimately do log of n amount of work in total because it, when it combines two sets together, only half the nodes will have to be updated. So anyway, the idea is that um, it will combinedly do log of e total work, or log of v work to total, sorry, log of v, if you add up all the work. Now, we're going to run this find operation e number of times. So if it's a combined total of log v, then it's going to average out to be constant. So it's going to average out, or other words, amortized to O of 1. Because the find will be Ultimately, collectively, we add up all the steps, it'll be log, a log of uh, V, but we do this E times. So if you average it, it's like taking, so find is log V. That's your sum divided by E is the average, and that's going to be much bigger. So it's going to average out to be constant. So, yeah. So then what happens here is, um, so now we see here for every operation, for um, this uh, loop, we're going to do a combined total of O of log E plus O of 1 plus O of 1. So total of O of log E is done, and we're going to do this E number of times. So 
what's going to happen to our runtime is going to be, well, we're going to have O of E plus O of E log E. So this is the more dominant term. So this is not going to really make any difference. And we can do a little bit of algebra because we see here that E in the worst case can be V squared. So log of V squared is just two times log V and two is a constant. So we actually can get the final result of O of E log V because E can be V squared. And then log of V squared, we take the exponent and bring it to the front. So it's going to be two times E log V and two is just a constant. So it doesn't matter in terms of um, big O analysis. That's the runtime. So same as Dijkstra's algorithm, so which is actually kind of nifty. However, this is not going to be a shortest path algorithm. So I mean, I'll put some notes over here for this. So this is not a shortest path algorithm. Now I suppose maybe um, the um, the result of Kriskel's algorithm could give you um, the edges that form shortest paths from your start to all the other nodes, but there's no guarantee. It's not really what's the intended purpose is. So it's not going to uh, construct a shortest path uh, tree like Dijkstra's does. So it's just to make this clear. So same runtime, but there are different um, tasks they're trying to um, solve. And also some more notes over here. If um, there are duplicate edge weights in the graph, then there can be more than one possible uh, minimum spanning tree of of the graph. Not for sure, but if it's, if it's duplicate edges, edge weights, then there could be more than one possible spanning tree because when we're when we're popping edges off the heap, well, if there are two that has the weight of one, then we don't know which one can get processed first. But for the exam purpose, however, I'm going to make sure that the edges are all unique. So that way it's easier to grade 80 people's um, exams. So it's much more straight. I can just kind of just directly you know, check my solution with your solution. So it's much faster for me than having to have to try all the possibilities that could arise. So, but if there's only one, if there's no duplicate edges, then there's only one possible MST. So, so if there are no duplicate um, edge weights in the graph, then there is only one possible MST of of the graph. Um, all right, that's kind of a no brainer there. Now, one other sort of bullet I want to mention is, okay, so we're given a graph. And so given a graph of unique, and then I guess, all edge weights are unique and we construct um, an MST 
that contains a set of edges. I'll call this, um, I'll call this, I guess, um, M for right now. If we add a constant, um, add, add the same constant to all edges of G, then, um, then, um, let's see, try to write this out nicely. Then, um, we can construct an MST for this new graph M prime with edges M prime and of course M intersect with M prime would be empty. Okay, sorry. Um, it's going to contain I guess, um, M, sorry. So the idea here is that if I have a graph and all unique edges, and I add some constant to every edge, then the same spinning tree will be created. It's not gonna make any difference. It will create the same sort of uh, spinning tree. So for example, just up here, I'm gonna scroll for a second. If I added uh, two to every single edge, in this graph, we get the same exact result you would have, the same picture we would get actually. So just that's what I was trying to say with this. Now, I'm not going to prove that this algorithm Chris Coles does work. You actually can prove this using contradiction that the whole idea is that if it doesn't create the best possible solution, then a contradiction happens because there's no way because you always pick the next best one every single time. So, um, yeah, I don't want to, I don't have time to cover the proof of this, but I guess just, I guess, believe me for right now, this is going to always work, but the proof really is that, um, you just, you know, show a by counter contradiction, you have to prove that, that this is going to work. So anyway, um, I guess I'm going to go ahead and just sort of, um, summarize all of this up and other contents up, uh, next week. So. Next week will be our final week of the semester. So we're going to have an exam review for one, maybe even two days, depending on how things go. And uh, I guess that's it for today. So I guess take care. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. Have an awesome Thanksgiving uh, weekend. And I will see you guys um, next week, uh, Monday.